afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Marriott Library. My name is Julie Hines, and I'm chair of the Friends of the Marriott Library Advisory Board. We're very pleased to have you with us today. Uh, hello to Dean Alberta Comer, Dean of the Marriott Library, and her husband, John. We really appreciate your support of our Friends events. Thank you. Uh, Friends board members who are with us today include Carol Yost, Ann Staples, Kent Schantz, Dan Donahoe, and Greg Thompson. And I'm pleased to welcome a new member of the board, my former colleague in the Marriott Library, Linda Kider. Thank you, Linda. And thanks to all the board members for your ongoing interest in the work and the outreach and the collections of the Marriott Library. We really appreciate it. I want to let you know about one upcoming Friends event before we begin the program today. The annual Book Collector Evening will be February 12th at the Alta Club here in Salt Lake City. Our speaker will be Michael Vinson, who is a rare books dealer from Santa Fe, New Mexico. Mr. Vinson will be speaking on his forthcoming book titled Bluffing Texas Style, The Arson, Forgery, and High Stakes Poker Capers of Rare Book Dealer Johnny Jenkins. The life story of Jenkins is quite an interesting one, and among other things in his career, he worked as principal organizer of a national system for identifying and publicizing the theft or loss of rare books and other valuable materials from, from libraries, booksellers, and private collections, and here, in the library and rare books world, we're really, we really appreciate that work. You're all invited to this special evening on February 12th that includes a social hour, a silent book auction, dinner, and the program. The ticket price is $60, and if you have paid your friend's dues, your ticket price is $50. Um, we really hope you'll consider joining us for that event. We have some cards in the back with information about the Book Collector Evening on February 12th. Now I will introduce Greg Thompson, who will introduce our speaker today. Greg is Associate Dean for Special Collections and my longtime colleague here in the Marriott Library. Dr. Thompson is recognized for his background as a Western historian and for building a strong Marriott Library Special Collections with the support of many donors across uh, Utah and across the country. Greg, I will turn the time over to you now. Thank you, Julie, very much, and welcome. It's great to have you here on a sunny afternoon that isn't freezing, sort of. And uh, we're delighted that you're here. I would like to uh, turn your attention in the rear of the room on the table uh, where Judy Jaro is. We have a couple of, of uh, printed lectures that were given through the William R. and Erlin J. Gould uh, lecture that is held and sponsored by the J. Willard Marriott Library every year mid-September, and uh, that lecture is on technology and the quality of life. There are two in the series that relate to uh, our presentation today. Thought you might enjoy the pickup. Uh, they've been given uh, some years ago, so there's an, certainly an update going on, and we'll hear about that today. I. Uh, I think you will indeed find this afternoon's topic most interesting, um, climate change and the reasons for climate change have been very much in the news for the last two years. There's been a revival of discussion about that, uh, not that there was a great drop before, but certainly it's been emphasized. And our friends of the J. Willard Marriott Library Board thought it would be most appropriate to um, continue the discussion and sponsor uh, a dialogue on the topic. And uh, you will, of course, hear that today through our friend speaker, his publication and his pr presentation today. 
I would like to reference for just a minute a very recent article that was an op-ed piece in the Salt Lake Tribune, Dr. Scott Williams, uh, who is executive director of the uh, Health Environment Alliance of Utah, or commonly called Healed Utah, and his policy associate, Jessica Reamer, uh, offered a review of the fossil fuel use and the percentage of pollution emissions created by their use along the Wasatch Front. If you didn't see it, I encourage you to go back and pull it up. It's very interesting. Not only does it list the percentage of, of uh, fossil fuel contributions to our uh, environmental and pollution uh, issues on the Wasatch Front, but it also articulated the cost for addressing them. Their op-ed was written in response to Governor Herbert, <coughs> Gov uh, excuse me, Governor Herbert's inclusion of a $100 million uh, budget item in his annual budget submitted to the legislature for consideration last month and uh, would be his projected state fiscal budget for 2019-2020. The article, the op-ed article was indicating that it was a bit uh, thin on the dollar amount given the nature of our pollution and its problems. I see this article uh, as an important way to introduce our discussion today and our speaker, Gregory Meehan. Um, Mr. Meehan will discuss his recently published book entitled, Thank You, Fossil Fuels, and Good Night, I love that title, The 21st Century's Energy Trans uh, Transition. This, this publication was published by the University of Utah Press. It's a 2017 uh, issued work. And um, as you will note in your program, Mr. Meehan is, uh, there's some uh, biographical information about him. He graduated from the University of Maryland uh, with a degree in civil engineering. He had uh, a long career uh, in associated areas. Once he retired in 2013, he returned to uh, his long uh, held interest of examining energy, fossil fuels, and sustainable fuel substitutes. I'm delighted to uh, welcome Mr. Gregory Meehan to the podium today to talk about Thank you, fossil fuels, and good night. Thanks, Greg. <clears throat> well, thank you all for coming out here on a Sunday. Um, I see Utah Press here. I want to thank you for taking the time and all the effort in publishing the book. It was a pure pleasure writing the book. <clears throat> and I'm, to the title, my wife came up with a title, and I was struggling with it, the, the title. And uh, so it is, it, it is somewhat of a sincere thank you, fossil fuels, but it is clearly a good night. It's time to go. Um, and I want to describe why I believe in, that, that we're going to see fossil fuels diminish rapidly as an energy source this century. Uh, what are the forces that are converging that's making that happen? And when I think about you know, what in, the approach to the book is an old quote from Kennedy that says, too often we have a luxury of an opinion without the discomfort of a thought. And as it relates to the field of energy, every day you can read articles that are mutually incompatible, sometimes within the same publication. So it's very confusing to get an eye on what's really happening. So I, the spirit of this book is, is one that's foundational. If you read it, it's going to give you the basis from which you can read any article, and there, you, you got st strength and understanding from which how to interpret this, and what's maybe real and what's not real. So um, what I'd like to do is step through this. It's 3.15. I'd like to step through this. It's a lot of material. And then I'd like to have a half an hour of questions um, 
So there'll be plenty of time for that. All right, so here we go. So let me think about this in terms of a life cycle. You know, you ask yourself, everything has a life cycle. We have a life cycle, industries all have them. So where is fossil fuel in its life cycle? And we, you know, it's very typical uh, products uh, enter the introduction phase and they work on honing their value proposition, their cost proposition. If they're lucky and they get it right, they enjoy this nice growth phase. When one company is enjoying a nice growth phase, I mean, someone, someone else is seeing a decline phase. And often incumbents in a field take energy. Um, they, they have two approaches. They can either get out front and innovate, or they can discount the disruptive technology. And what will happen, take ExxonMobil. One could argue that they're an energy company. They define themselves as a petrochemical company. So by the end of the century, ExxonMobil will be uh, insignificant in the energy field, and they will be competing against biosources for even the chemical feedstocks. So often incumbents define themselves, box themselves in, and new entrants come and take the marketplace. You can look at so many different industries and see that. So my conclusion is fossil fuels are, there's three of them. They're in decline or maturing. And what we have over here is disruptive non-carbon energy sources that are emerging. They are, they are solving the economic gap that they had 10 years ago. That does not exist now, so let's be done with that. They are economically superior in the right location. And they have value propositions that I'll talk about in a moment that supplant uh, and that fossil fuels can't compete with. So, if you're skeptical that we can move fast, think about, it was just a century ago, we came up with personal transportation. Now we have a billion cars on the road. It was just over a century ago that we had first flight, and now we're landing on comets. So we, we think we're wedded to fossil fuels and that we, we, there's not an alternative to these prehistoric soups. It's not correct. When the markets move, they will move very quickly. We often think, think of markets as moving slow, and then when they do move, they move faster than you expect. And we're going to see the same thing here. So there's example after examples of, of where, you, when you hit a tipping point, triggers happen. Things don't move. And I'll back up just a, I know from business, I spent many years in business. One of the mistakes businesses do often, if they're sitting here, management may say, geez, if I look at the last year sales projections and I project that forward, this is not much of a product. Same thing up top. If I look at my last five years sales, sales growth, I feel pretty good about it. But what happens is that you're at these inflection points and they change fast and they catch, catch people by surprise. All right, so now what I want to do is put the put to bed, if there's any question, do we really have alternative to, to fossil fuels? We absolutely have the alternative. So let me explain this fairly quickly. That circle in the center, that's 33 terawatt years. That's what the US Department EIA projects is the global demand for energy in 2040. On the left are the potential, the practical potential energies of solar, 200, wind, 10, hydro, geothermal, just to name a few. So you can see we have more than enough to power the world in 2040. So if, we, if there's skepticism that renewables, that we have an alternative to fossil fuels, put that to bed. We do. And we have the economics. So on the right, I just showed you that's fuels. Those are, you know, if you look at that, uh, fuels are depleted when you use them, whereas on the, on the left, renewables are power sources. They're perpetual. So these are the, uh, uh, the amount of energy we have in these stored fuels. I'll talk about uh, the, the uh, uh, thermal neutron, nuclear. I'll talk about that in a little bit. I will make a point. I believe that the urgency around climate change is going to ratchet up. It's, not gonna, it's just going to continue to ratchet up, and we're going to find ourselves with increased urgency to move. 
So every carbon, non-carbon energy source we have should be on the table when that time comes. There are superior um, technologies. Most of the thermal, te thermal neutron plants that we have in the U.S., actually all of them, all 100 of them, are old technologies. There's been innovation. Generation 4 nuclear technology dramatically changes the risk profile. So I want to, I can't go into nuclear, but I do want to say I predict that urgency around climate change is going to pick up, and so every non-carbon energy choice should be on the table. And it depends on where you live, uh, how you will think about that. Just as a backdrop, how do we use our energy today? These are energy sources in the US on the left and the sectors that they serve on the right. So you can see we have nuclear, renewable coal, natural gas, and petroleum. On the right, the energy sectors are transportation, industrial, residential, commercial, and the power. Look at, you'll notice nuclear, 100% of nuclear serves the, the power industry. Uh, Half of renewables today are serving the power sector. The other are, are uh, really ethanol and transportation primarily. Petroleum is primarily driving the transportation sector. So in the future, what will happen is these will decline. The fossil fuels will decline. These will ramp up. Transportation sector will largely disappear, and it will become a consumer of the power sector. We're going to go to all electric vehicles by mid-century. And we already have countries around the world that are already selling more all-electric cars than internal combustion cars. All right, so we're turning the page on fossil fuels. What are the obstacles? So a nice framework when you think about the marketplace, the energy market, what are the forces that are at play today? Well, you've got the, the, and the repressive forces on the continued use of fossil fuels. So economically viable alternatives, you'll see in slides ahead how in many locations, we, they're already superior economically, and their trends continue to go down in costs, while at the same time, the marginal cost of fossil fuel production is going up. So you have those two, and those are incremental. They're year by year. Those, those, those cost curves are crossing, and market by market, it's a different answer to what's the best investment. The really the big changes that are going to drive this market are energy independence and stability. Every country's energy plan that I've read, and I've read over 50, state energy independence. The U.S. has it. Every country wants energy independence. They don't want the political... Uh, angles to their supply lines and mitigating disruption. So you have that. That's always been there. But when you had fossil fuels, you're importing them. You don't have an option. You can't activate on that energy independence. And alternative renewable energies are, for the first time, giving countries a choice. I can now continue to import. I have effects on my trade balance. Or I can set a plan and year by year build capacity in renewables locally. And I think the really big force that's going to shift away, shift, have us shift away from the continued use of fossil fuels is the environment and climate. Think about in the 1970s, we had tailpipe emission regulations that we put out. So we, we, we refined sulfur and lead out of our gasoline. We've done all these things, but many years later, we're still using Gasoline. So there's a case where regulation made improvements, but it didn't change our energy source. But to the extent climate change and concern with greenhouse gases escalates, you can't avoid CO2 with fossil fuels. The only way to move and address that force is non-carbon energy sources. So these, three, four, these four forces, if you think about every market, you know, we stand in the U.S., but if you stand in Western Europe, you stand in Japan, you stand in China, India, you stand in Africa, the, the, when you sum up these forces, they're very, very different depending on your location. So let, we'll keep that in mind. All right, so let me start talking about renewables. 
unlike a coal plant, you can put a coal plant anywhere and it's going to have a certain efficiency of producing electricity. You put a wind turbine up in Anchorage, Alaska, or a solar panel in, in certain locations, they could be very efficient. So what's, what's most important about renewables, think about it, they are location specific. There are places where nature says, this is where you can harvest wind, and there are places where you can harvest solar energy. So often you'll see pushback on the cost of solar. Well, look closely at the article. It may be cost of solar energy in Maine, but compare that against solar energy in the southwest of the US, and you get a different story. Or So look up here. On the left, you see these are winds. This is published by NASA. These are winds at 50 meters. The turbines are close to 90, 100 meters now. But this is the average wind speed. And the lighter it is, is the more potent that is. So what's interesting, at 40 degrees latitude, north and south, you see the westerly, the big band of wind. So those are beautiful places to harvest wind. Year in, year out, the wind blows. Um, now you compare that over on the right. You've got solar, that bright band. That's kind of the break point where it doesn't make a lot of sense to put solar above that. So wind and solar, to some extent, are complementary uh, renewables, where, where solar has high seasonal uh, impact and where the insulation is less, wind picks up. So globally, I guess the point is globally, whether you're uh, in the low latitudes or upper latitudes, you have accessible renewable energy you can tap into. Okay? Now, maybe I'll make a point. It also comes back to, uh, speaks to some of the pushback. When we think about solar, it, at least at the Earth's surface, it's temporal, right? Where fuels are concentrated, solar is, is diffused on the Earth's surface. Where fuels are forms of stored energy, Solar radiation is undulating daily between on and off. And where fuels are, are finite, solar is renewable. So they've got these differences. But the differences are not insurmountable. The point is, for us to go to renewables, we have complementary technologies that we're going to have to build. We're going to have to build our storage technologies, short-term storage, likely with batteries, longer-term storage with a new age fuel. But we'll need a smart grid. Our grid today, our electrical grid, is really a demand-oriented grid. You, you pop a switch, and it's built to deliver you that energy. What will happen now is we'll have smarter technology, storage technologies, that will start to balance the supply and demand. It'll be different, but it's not insurmountable. All right, I, maybe a heads up. When you think about when I see articles, um, and I'll listen to some of the um, incumbents in the, in the space talk about uh, reserves and new fields that they are investing in. I think it's important to think about you've got resource in the ground, and the reserves are what are technologically re recoverable, right? Our, we constantly are improving our technology and what we can recover. But what's different, and for the last 50, 100 years, we've been able to maintain our forward supply of fossil fuels by opening up new fields and introducing new technology. But what's very different now when you look at it, when the price of fossil fuels goes up, investment in renewables goes up. So it's putting a lid on, is, is you're a supplier of petroleum, and I've said this all, petroleum is going to live in the $30 to $70 a barrel window for the longest time. If they raise it up too much, and they're smart, those folks that sit on top of the oil wells, they sit on top, they're trying to meter it out to maximize, and they know if they raise the price, there's alternatives now. So for the first time, fossil fuels have competition that can limit what you can put in. And I will tell you, reserves are overstated. Long after we stop using fossil fuels, there'll be plenty of fossil fuels in the ground. We're going to leave them behind long before um, We've, we've pulled them, all right? All right, so the cost curves are going in opposite direction. And let me just give you an, an example. This is unsubsidized data 
from Lazard, and, and it's for the power sector. So you can look up there, combined gas is, is of the fossil fuels is the, is the most economical. Come down, you see coal, nuclear. And the, nuclear in the U.S. is highly regulated, in the, and that's, that's uh, apparent in, in the cost that you see. You see solar PV, uh, the most attractive here. Onshore wind is more attractive. Geothermal, where, where you have it, is competitive. But you can see solar PV and wind are superior economically today in the U.S. in the right locations. Okay? Down at the bottom, you start to see the fuel cell is one of the um, uh, ways in which you can store. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example that Germany's done where they, when they, when they have more renewable energy, producing more energy than they need at the time in the, in the grid, they, they basically produce hydrogen. And then when the demand uh, supply is, is insufficient, they use that hydrogen to uh, bring back electricity. All right, so I also want to point out, we talk about, is there any way we can do carbon capture and sequestration? And we've not done it, right? But here's an example. I find it frustrating, but it does, I, I guess, uh, it makes transparent the hierarchy of, of cost over the environment. So right up north of us in Saskatchewan, there's a 139 megawatt coal power plant that has capture and sequestration technology. It captures more than 90% of its effluent CO2, puts it in a pipeline. Unfortunately, that CO2 is used for enhanced oil recovery. But it does point out that they made an event. The technology exists. They've implemented it. They've implemented it because of the economics of selling that CO2. So the question you ask is, is climate change a concern? And should we be capturing our CO2? And if so, you know. So you ask, should we be regulating these CO2 emissions to force this technology forward? If you don't associate a cost with CO2 emissions, technology that works doesn't come forward. And today, I think we've not activated. We, we worry about these things, but we've really not done anything in our economic systems to drive the kinds of changes we need. Now, I wanted to do a, a little bit of a framework. As I, I felt like when I was doing the research of the book, I wanted to get out of the US perspective. You know, I kind of grew up here, kind of know the US perspective on things. But I wanted to check what our friends around the world are doing. And so I'm pulling out all these energy policies, and I'm reading them. And I started to see a common thread. So what I've done is along the x-axis, I call it the fossil fuel wealth factor. I added up their reserves, every country's reserve, and I did this for 230 countries, added up their reserves of fossil fuels and put it on a per capita basis. And I plotted it. This is on a log scale. So if you have one, that means you have your fair share of fossil fuels. If you have 100, <laughs> you have significantly more than your share. So you can see Saudi Arabia over there. On the vertical axis, I, I plotted what is your energy consumption on a per capita basis. <clears throat> and I find that there's an inverse relationship between your, real cons your desire to act on climate change and the amount of reserves you have. The more reserves you have, the more skeptical you are of climate change. Where, where you don't have reserves clouding the equations, you're, you're, you're already there. So what you have when you look at these countries, and then you read their energy policy, once you see this, you can go, oh, it makes sense. I can see where they're coming from. So I called the, the group in the top left the vulnerable, because these are high consumers of energy, but they have realistically no local domestic supplies, right? At least historically. So they're reliant on imports. So you see South Korea, Japan, Western Europe. In the lower quadrant, these are folks that have very few fossil fuel reserves, but they're looking to develop. And it was interesting, there was a, uh, God, years ago I saw it, and it, it kind of it, it gives you pause when you think about it. There was a Karolinska, a global health group out of Karolinska Institute, and he plotted 
countries are similar like that. He had a bubble plot. Look it up on the internet. It's very provocative. He made the case, he looked at the data, and he looked at it over a 100-year period. He made the case that countries can't get wealthy until they get healthy. And he showed, and he had characteristics that would, you know, birth mortality, things that, factors that would signif signify health, and then he had other factors that he played so you, that, that would be wealth, and he plotted those. And country after country, you would see they got healthy and then they, then they got health, wealthy. And I would argue that if you don't have access to energy, you can't get healthy and you can't get wealthy. It's so fundamental, right? And, and you look at many of the countries that are in the duly challenged, renewables will be their first access to affordable energy and electricity. So you look on the right, there's countries that are fortunate. They have more than their fair share. And these, many of these are the exporting countries. And I particularly enjoyed anybody from Canada here. Um, I love reading Canada's, I'm being somewhat cynical, because they're, they're, they, in their energy policy, they talk about um, environmental consciousness. But at the same time, they're making tremendous investment in the exportation of fossil fuels. And I, I kind of, you can't have it both ways. But it does make you realize that the countries that today are fortunate probably are at greatest risk. Because they're going to have countries that are dependent upon energy, the sale of energy staples, and their economy. I mean, you can look at Norway, you can look at a number, Canada. These countries have to refashion their economy this century. And they've got a certain amount of time to do that. So I, I think, looking forward, the fortunate or the unfortunate, <laughs> they've probably got the biggest challenge. The vulnerable have now opportunity. So who to look at for what? I also point out that over 200 countries have well less than their share of fossil fuels. So there are 200 countries over there chomping at the bit for an opportunity to source their energy staples local. And when that trigger point hits, when the economics are right, and the complementary technologies are in place, this is not going to be something that moves over hundreds of years. This will move very, very quickly. Okay? And you have 30 countries that have been fortunate over the years to have more than their fair share, and it's given them an economic jump start on the rest of the world. Well, things are changing. And it's not surprising if you look at the investment in renewable energy capacity on a per capita basis, the top five, Western Europe, top five in wind and solar. So when you look around the world, it's predictive. This country framework that I have is, is basically saying the early movers are going to be the folks that don't have fossil fuel resources. They're going to move for self-sufficiency. The countries that are more concerned with climate change and believe in climate change, they're going to make it a priority to move. Unfortunately, here in the US, we seem to have a kind of a whipsaw um, approach to energy. I have a, a good friend of mine that, that's an attorney, and he writes transactional um, uh, agreements uh, for pipelines and, and uh, uh, extraction projects in, in Texas right now. And you see that we're going to be the, the Permian Basin, that we're going to be flowing a lot of oil out of there. But what's happened now with $70 a barrel, when it was 50, most of those projects were um, green lighted on the assumption of 70 plus dollars a barrel. At less than 50, they're not so interesting, and the investment in Texas is, is going down dramatically, which is an example. We've been there, whips all, we invest and we don't. Sooner or later, I think our policy in the US has to take a longer view of where the world's going to be and let's go. Right? So, Common pushbacks with renewables. And before I get into, you know, intermittency is one of the chief, you know, the sun's not always shining, the wind's not always blowing, we see a turbine that's sitting quiet. Well, I'll tell you, I want to remind us that every day we have a huge energy technology 
that feeds 7 billion people a year that relies on the sun that's intermittent. We figured it out. We know how to store food, deliver food, get it where it needs to be. It, it, it's the equivalent of 3 million tons of coal daily, our, our, our food energy sector, if you will. So I've kind of brought that up and say, if we think we can't solve the intermittency through smart grids and storage devices, I call that false resistance, right? It's an obstacle. Um, I, it, it kind of plays into inertia. Let's keep doing things the way we've done them. All right, so here I am in California. Here's an example of what their, um, their renewables are doing during the course of the day. So they've got the geothermal that's just steady, consistent, kind of a base load. You've got biomass <clears throat> and even small hydro consistent through the course of the day, but you can see the winds come in, winds go down, sun goes up, sun goes down, the wind comes up. So you look at this, it, it doesn't show, but the, the solar is a big bubble um, in the center here. It doesn't come through here, I apologize. So you look at that and you say, geez, how can I link this to consumers? And I think the missing link is, is supply. You're going to have smart devices in your home that will look at the grid. And when the grid is producing, your devices are going to come on and they're going to use energy. And when the energy is below, they'll cut back. So you're going to have smart devices that can now marry supply and demand much more effectively in addition to your storage devices. Okay. So I think about one of the other pushbacks with renewables is they're inefficient. And I've, I found that, as a chemical engineer, somewhat funny, because if you look at our food industry, it roughly is about 2% efficient. Solar en energy converted into biomass, 2%. So when you think about a solar PV, it's 25% efficient. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that's highly efficient. <clears throat> but one of the things that, you know, the energy sector is constantly moving energy into different forms, and there's always loss. It's like a leaky pipe. So I think when we're looking at, at uh, solutions, we'll look at ways in which we can minimize the, the losses, the conversion, the unnecessary conversion of energy. We'll, we'll look to use it directly versus indirectly. But even there, you'll see a technology that's, that I'm a big fan of coming out of Japan that uses the, the lost energy for heating, home heating and uh, heat applications. So uh, there's solutions coming along for this. So when I think about <coughs> you know, some of the challenges of, of renewables, where do, you, where do you collect it? You can carve out you know, 3,500 acres in the Mojave Desert which in my mind is, is mimicking our centralized paradigm that we have with our fossil fuels and ignoring, well not ignoring, but not taking advantage of the fact that solar energy is diffused. I really like what this group out of France has done with the Wattway. They've got a thousand kilometer highway with solar cells on it that they're, they're proving. And again, that's introduction phase. Is it ready to scale up? No, but are they innovating, getting the materials right? Yes. They've recently moved, they've done an 18 mile stretch of road in Georgia. So they're expanding. Um, so you can, you can follow the old paradigm or you can start to collect your solar energy where you've already developed. And there's just a lot of innovation out there. All right, so now what I wanted to do was uh, do a kind of a rapid fire to show you what's happening some technologies and some projects around the world that will give you reason to believe and reason to hope that we can move quickly. All right, so let's start. Here's the one that I mentioned in Germany. So Germany up in the north, they have a great, great uh, resource for wind. And what they've done is they've, adjacent to an eight megawatt wind farm, they've built this 6.3 megawatt electrolyzer. So when the windmills, wind turbines are producing above load, they direct it to the turbine, it creates hydrogen. And hydrogen, uh, if you see on the right, hydrogen can be put in a tanker. There's hydrogen fuel cell cars. Uh, so they could be, they're gonna build a number of, of hydrogen fuel, fuel stations. You can put it into a pipeline, 
or you could run that hydrogen back and generate electricity back into the grid uh, when the, the demand is above supply. So that's beginning to show you how we can step into the future, right? Uh, I like the one out of Japan, and I project, they, I think they're close to a million of these units. It looks like a heat pump, but what it is is to, at your home, it's an on-demand uh, electricity generation in your home. So they take hydrogen, it generates electricity. So you pop on a light switch, this, this uh, piece of equipment generates the electricity. The heat that's given off from the inefficiency of converting hydrogen back into electricity is used for space heating and heat generation in the home. They claim that you can get upwards to 90% efficiency, round trip efficiency of hydrogen when you take these thermal applications. So they're decentralizing the power industry. What we think of is you've got these big power plants, right? In, in parts of the world, in Western Europe, they're decentralizing power. And in Japan, their vision of the future is every home has an on-demand system for generating electricity. And uh, it has the added benefit of utilizing the thermal energy that's lost in, 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 uh, in the conversion locally. There's a, uh, uh, I was working on a second book on, on the following our, uh, our trash, if you will, our use of materials. And 8% of petroleum worldwide is used for the generation of plastics, right? And only 5% of our plastics is recycled. So we've got a big problem that's occurring. So there, I followed uh, where I live, the recycle goes to a, a plant <clears throat> and they pull out the cardboard and the milk jugs and some water bottles, the rest of it, they pack it up and send it over to the incinerator, or they send it over to China, depending on the market conditions. So what they did at the incinerator is they have a thermal grid that delivers thermal energy that's given off from the incinerator, and it, and it delivers the thermal energy into downtown Baltimore. So there's thermal grids <clears throat> out there. Here's some projects that I thought Keep in mind, are people familiar with what you pay retail for your kilowatt hour of electricity? People, like in, in Salt Lake, what do you pay? 10, 11, 12 cents? 13 or 14? <clears throat> okay, so with that in mind, look at these projects. These are projects, sign, purchase, price agreements. So these are developers of these projects are selling the electricity and making profit at these dollar amounts. So you look at Mexico, 3.6 cents per kilowatt hour, they're selling electricity. Um, you've got 2.74, these are three projects that are signed with P, PPAs. You go to Dubai, 3 cents. You go to um, Rajasthan, India, 4.2. Um, Chile, 2.91. Uh, that's superior to the best combined gas power plant in the world. In the right location, the technology is there. Okay, a couple other, uh, if you look at wind, down at the bottom, I would point out that people were forecasting 10 cents per kilowatt hour for offshore wind by 2020. Things are moving faster. 5.4 cents in Denmark, uh, and we'll talk about Denmark in a moment. Uh, the Netherlands, 5.9 cents offshore, and there's three cents onshore for Morocco. So wind in the right location is superior economically, and I would say on those dimensions of environmental health and self-sufficiency, fossil fuels can't compete. <clears throat> All right, this gives you a, just a view of investment in energy projects in the power sector around the world. You can see for the last number of years, renewable uh, has more investment than fossil fuels. I'd like to see fossil fuels take a nosedive, personally. Um, nuclear is flat. And large hydro, I think we've taken it as far as you can go. I think you're going to see more investment in maybe run of the river where that, that, that can take place. But um, gives you a sense that investment is already moving towards renewables. It needs to accelerate dramatically if we're going to dodge, I think, the effects of climate change. Um, here's some country goals. If you look at Germany, there's some pain in Germany. <laughs> They're out front, and I'm not saying they don't 
there, there's not pain associated. But their goal by 2050 is to have 80% of their uh, electricity generated by uh, renewables, non-carbon based. Um, and the, the most impressive thing that Germany is doing, to me at least, is 50%, they want to cut 50% of their consumption through conservation and efficiency programs. So they're coming at it both ways. Let's reduce our rapacious use of energy. Let's make those kinds of investment, as well as investment in non-carbon base. I like Denmark. Denmark is just, they've got some very, very, if you follow, they're out front. And they've got like the Kennedy moon landing goal. They want to be across all sectors, discontinue fossil fuels by 2050. And you can see pictures of 1985 to 2009 of how much they've decentralized the power sector. So, you know, they're using biosources, they're, they're, they're capturing therm using thermal energies. By decentralizing it, they're making their use of energy much more efficient and they're decentralizing um, the uh, generation of electricity. Here you go, look at renewable energy. Uh, as I said, by the end of this century, fossil fuels will have less than 20% of, of primary energy. You can already see that Finland, Latvia, Denmark, Aust Austria, and Slovenia are already at 40 and above of final primary energy generated from renewables. US, I just kind of talked to, you know, my, my look at it is we, we have a whipsaw energy policy. We don't look too far ahead. I think we're um, unfortunate in that we have the power of choice and inertia has us going back to our fossil fuel reserves and we're, we're not going to be the leaders uh, if we keep pace with some of the new technologies. I think countries like South Korea are actively investing in technology, smart grids, et cetera, for export opportunities. So we're, we're, we're kind of taking that measured approach that, that I call it, it's, uh, it's unfortunate. But I believe in the US, uh, action will happen at the state and local level. You have Aspen that as of 2015 is 100% is renewable on their power grid. They're using hydroelectric and wind and then uh, gas from landfills. <clears throat> You've got Hawaii by 2045, that's geothermal and wind. Um, you've got Vermont, Maine, California. So you can see these renewable portfolio standards. I think you ratchet those up. If you think about policy, that's one of my favorite policies. Just ratchet up your renewable portfolio standards and insist on uh, more and more of your power sector um, uh, sourced by this. I, I will say that our economic lens is broken <clears throat> and the world does move on economics and uh, there's some uh, impressive reports in the, as the evidence mounts. We need to be building in the consequences of our use of fossil fuels into their cost of their offering so that renewables and alternatives compete on a fair basis. And uh, I, I, I have to talk about the yellow jackets in Paris, right? And uh, there's a proposed, I think it's proposed at this point, uh, carbon tax on fuel. And we've got this huge, you know, uh, public resistance to this. And, and I agree with that 100%. I think the right thing to do with a carbon tax is put it way up where the big decisions are made. Don't put it down at the consumer level. Put it way up where the decision is made. So when someone has to invest in a power plant, you, you, you impose the cost of the carbon emissions on option one, <laughs> option two, option three, and then it helps you make the right choices. And I also think that the, if carbon tax is unpopular, but if you make it avoidable, where you, it forces you to make the right decision, and it's avoidable, you pay it. If, if, you, if you make this decision, you don't pay it. You can avoid it when you make this decision. It just forces us to come to terms with climate change is a threat. It's a global threat. And it is, and I, I tell you, the more I read every year that goes by, my, the urgency that I feel is, is increased. And, and I think that's going to be true around the world. So we got to fix that. I've talked about that. I want to also talk about price. When you get into the, um, the, the idea of, of uh, conservation and efficiency, 
if you don't drive that, right, it doesn't happen, right? Um, so I, I find it fascinating when you look at, you know, consumer staples, gasoline, electricity, look at the price of, of gasoline um, per, per gallon uh, from Venezuela uh, all the way to Norway. And in Norway, who is, is probably one of the wealthiest countries from a fossil fuel reserve perspective, they've driven up their, their cost of, of uh, gasoline and they're selling more electric cars in some periods, in some quarters than they do in internal combustion. But they also use those high taxes to fund a huge dollar to refashion their economy post fossil fuel export. So you've got that and then you've got cross um, um, border smuggling of gasoline out of Venezuela. So you've got everything in between. And you can see US is kind of in the low end. So if you want to drive conservation and efficiency, you get your prices up. We all know that when the prices go up, we get more e uh, efficient cars and the mix of cars consumers buy is different than when the prices come down. So price is an important tool as a policy. Uh, look at our electricity pricing, the same thing there. When you look at industry and consumers, you can see Germany and Denmark have high um, consumer prices. Um, and they're using that price tool as a way to drive efficiency, investment efficiency. So now if I come out with a product that is 50% more efficient and you're paying that kind of a price, that's, you're now as a consumer going to buy that from me. So you can avoid that higher price by buying efficient projects. And it's helping companies uh, build a business case for building efficiency into their products. Okay, so when I think about this, I'm right at four o'clock. When I look at change is inevitable, where do I think we are? I think large hydro is going as far as it's going to go from hydro. I think coal is kind of at its end point and we're going to start to see on a, on a year by year basis decline in the use of coal. I think petroleum in the transportation sector is going to be the next to move into decline phase. I think natural gas will be the last fossil fuel standing. I think disruptive technologies that are on the, um, they're on what I call it the exponential growth curve already or onshore wind, solar PV, but we've got a long way to go to build the right kinds of capacity. Offshore is getting there. And then nuclear, they have this fast reactor <coughs> um, that, that I think would be very interesting. It uses the spent fuel from all the generation one and two reactors and you can build these 30 megawatt modular reactors, plant them in the ground, they're like a nuclear battery. While at the same time, you're consuming spent fuel that we are safeguarding for an eternity, fast reactor gives you an opportunity to, to basically burn that in your reactor at the same time generating electricity. So I think it depends on, in the US, there's huge resistance to nuclear around the world. Uh, that varies. Uh, um, Russia has already put up in, home of Chernobyl, I will point out, but they've already got an 800 megawatt uh, fast reactor that they've put in place. China is, is turning them on. South Korea is developing them. So around the world, fast reactor is, is poised to grow. I don't think they were going to be implementing any more thermal neutron reactors. We'll retire them as time goes by. So I think the last word is many of the vulnerable countries are going to find themselves, if they don't look forward, um, it's going to be disruptive socially in, uh, in their economy. I think of Saudi Arabia and the, some of these countries that are so dependent, their wealth um, and their standard of living are so dependent upon fossil fuel exports. What are they going to do on the other side of this? Um, the largest source of energy for power and transportation will be alternatives. Um, oil and gas suppliers, I, I think of them as uh, if you know your time is running out, um, you're going to pump while you can, right? And there's, a, there's many countries with, with petroleum reserves. So I think we're in for an extended period of where petroleum will be priced low. But the low cost manufacturers are going to own that market. They're going to keep the prices low, keep competitors out. But even that's not a winning game plan through the century, right? It's just what's going to happen in the near term. Um, high cost reserves will never be extracted. Um, as I said, nuclear's role will increase uh, on two counts if the urgency around uh, decarbonizing our, our uh, sources goes up, or we don't move fast enough with renewables, and that urgency goes up. I think uh, micro uh, combined heat and power are going to become standards around the world. Um, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think hydrogen will likely, in the second half of the century, emerge as the new age fuel. 
And uh, finally, hopefully, U.S. gets on the move here. But early adopter nations, there's commercial opportunity. There's a lot of commercial opportunity in smart grids, all the different technologies we're going to need to bring together to solve um, um, our, our trans. As, as I say, uh, what is it? There's a quote I like. It's uh, life is pleasant, uh, death is peaceful. It's the transition that's difficult. And I think that's where we are. And that's my last word. And it's 4 o'clock, and I'd love to take any questions. We are fil uh, filming this and streaming it. I have a mic. Would you please raise your hand? I'll bring you the mic uh, to ask your question. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I don't notice any time frames on your futures. And um, so the question arises, is all any of this, all of it, sufficient to save us from frying? Um, well, let me put a couple of uh, time frames on it. By mid-century, um, I'll answer it in two parts. Uh, I believe by mid-century, maybe it went quickly, but the power sector and the transportation sectors will be largely non-carbon based by mid-century. I believe the challenge in the back half of the century will be around industrial heat applications and chemical feedstocks for the use. And you know, keep in mind, even if you use it in a feedstock, you're still taking what is a, fossil fuels are a huge carbon sink and you're bringing them to the surface. So, so even the use of uh, fossil fuels and the production of materials is a problem. And there'll be new solutions. But those are stickier, and that'll happen in the back half. To answer your question, whether it'll, is it fast enough? I don't think it's fast enough, but I also think on that, that four forces, I think that that force coming in from the right on health is going to increase in urgency. And, and I think that we'll, we'll find ourselves um, moving faster. Um, so I mean, that's my best forecast, right? Uh, mine's on the first, first question, quickly. Your, uh, uh, use of fossil fuels by 2050 and the, and the taking over, the uh, renewables taking over by 2050, is that worldwide? Is your a generalized idea yeah, or, I, or, I, or are you, or, and what about the United States? I think the U.S. is going to be a laggard unless things change. I, 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 st I still believe that, you know, when we pull out of the Paris Accord, those are, those are frustrating yeah. for, okay. um, the other, it, frustrating for our leadership. So what the answer to the question is, when I say globally, um, I think it's a global, aggregated up, there'll be outliers. There'll be countries that are 100%, many countries 100%, and there'll be other countries, U.S., what are we, 15% non-carbon today? We may be 25. Yeah. But the other one is, is the, are, are, there, is, are there places where the, in new construction that are in the viable solar region that you depicted, are there, is there anybody, any state in, in the U.S. or any country that is having compulsory solar installation on homes? Say that again, compulsory? Compulsory solar installation on new construction. Well, I think renewable portfolio standards is, is a... Well, I mean, but I mean compulsory by government, compulsory. Yeah, I think when you have uh, countries like Denmark that have stated at a, at a national level... Yeah, but uh, I'm, I'm speaking about... I'm, I'm just, if you know an examples, I'm curious. I mean, if, if I were God, I'd say everybody in Salt Lake is building new homes have to have solar panels, period. Yeah, yeah. They may have, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so I, I think I'm using the renewable portfolios in the U.S., they're law. I mean, you've got to do it, right? And, and similar in Germany. They're, so we have it maybe at a state level. Uh, in Western Europe, we're seeing it at a country level. These are mandates. Other questions? Uh, I'm wondering, is this on? Yeah, it's good. I hear you. Uh, I'm wondering about space flight and, and what's going to propel our rockets. 
and also our airplanes down here on Earth? Yeah, I think, uh, well, first of all, uh, you know, we use hydrogen in our rockets today. So, I mean, that's, that's uh, we already have that covered. You can easily generate hydrogen from these electrolyzers that we have. I think in the near term, when you look at the transportation sector, I, I believe air travel will go carbon neutral before it goes carbonless. So they'll, they'll use bio-sourced fuels, and many of the airlines are already validating that, and, and many of the engines today will be able to work with bio-sourced fuels. I think it's going to be more difficult before you get to you know, alternatives beyond that. Other questions? Thank you very, very yeah, much pleasure, for your presentation. Very yeah. interesting.